I will start by just a, a question. If you, if you consider the, the origin of life as a scientific topic, this means that you, you make an assumption. This assumption is that there exists a pathway from the inert world to the living world. And uh, this is represented here. We start from organic chemistry, a biotic chemistry, which means the chemistry that takes place without life. And then you, you reach biochemistry. And uh, the, the, the origin of life is somewhere in this pathway. We can uh, consider this pathway. And there must be some forces that, uh, that play the role in this, in this evolution. Uh, so that biochemistry may have developed from a biotic chemistry either by chance as a result of the, the forces uh, that were present in a given environment or as a result or of a known or unknown driving force. This field or the chemical part of this field is called prebiotic chemistry, which is in fact organic chemistry, which is more or less related to the origin of life. It can also be called a biotic organic chemistry, but you know that in chemistry lab, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, chemical industry, there are chemical reactions in organic chemistry that, uh, that can, can be performed without any linkage to the origin of life. So, a biotic chemistry, uh, or, a biotic organic chemistry is not a good definition for the chemistry of the origin of life. And I want also to warn you that the concept of prebiotic chemistry carries with it several misconceptions associated with the, the past beliefs. So, chem organic chemistry is usually uh, defined as the chemistry of compound having, having at least one carbon-hydrogen bond. And this is a case, for example, of uh, methane, of glycine, the most simple amino acid. But you have also inorganic carbon compounds, carbon dioxide, cyanide, and you can see hydrogen cyanide, which is a conjugated acid of cyanide, that in spite of having uh, a carbon-hydrogen bond, does not belong to organic chemistry. So there are exceptions to the rules. Another important point about uh, organic uh, chemistry is that is the degree of oxidation of organic uh, matter, which is below, excuse me, below the uh, more, the more oxi oxidized state of carbon, which is carbon dioxide with a degree of oxi oxidation of plus, plus four. Formaldehyde, for example, zero, methane, minus four. So the oxidation state is quite reduced, which means, in fact, that organic matter is usually instable under oxidizing condition, but it becomes much less instable in the absence of oxygen or other oxidizing agents. Another uh, important property of carbon is its electronegativity. Electronegativity is for an element the ability to uh, withdraw electrons uh, or to so that carbon uh, has a mean value of electronegativity of 2.5 uh, and this value uh, leads this element to form covalent bonds with most of the other elements that on the periodic table and what is uh, the difference uh, uh, with all the atoms that tend to form ionic bonds because uh, they have uh, di divergent values of electronegativity, such as when you consider sodium chloride, for example, which, it, which is formed from sodium and chlorine, that have different values of e electronegativity. When you make the reaction, you get sodium chloride, and sodium chloride in solution, uh, 
you, you have a complete separation of ions. You have no bonds between chlor, chlor, chloride and sodium ion. And in fact, it's only in the solid, where you have the solid uh, sodium chloride, where every atom is surrounded by six different uh, atoms of the other element. And in fact, there is no specific bond between uh, sodium and chloride in this case. With carbon, it's completely different. Carbon from, forms strong covalent bonds with itself, as I said, which is the reason why carbon can form long chain, complex architecture, but also with many other elements and especially with hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen and fluorine, almost independently of the values of their electronegativities that are indicated here. Uh, in covalent bonds, the electrons that participate to the bond, valence, bo uh, valence electrons, are shared between the two atoms. The two participants are, uh, and are not fully transferred. So that the result is that uh, covalent, covalent bonds are kinetically stable. It means that if, if, one, if you want one of the elements to, 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 to react, you need first to break partially this, uh, this bond. And this means that there are kinetic barriers to the, to, to, to the cleavage of the, of, the, of the bond and then to a reaction. You can, of course, as I said before, form complex architect architecture and this architecture are stable uh, for at geological time scales. Another important uh, information about organic chemistry is, uh, comes from uh, the, this table representing the abundance of the elements in the universe. So if you, start, if you take silicium, for example, silicon, for example, as a reference, you, don't, you have these different values. And what can be seen is that the four elements hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon are the most abundant re reactive elements in the universe. The two exceptions here are helium and neo, which uh, in fact are almost inert uh, uh, atoms that don't form any bond with any other atoms. It is quite logical that the chemistry of carbon is the, is the chemistry of uh, the organic chemistry, sorry, uh, is, the, is the chemistry of carbon with the most abundant reactive element in the universe. As uh, this, you form stable uh, compounds with lifetime that, uh, uh, of, of billion years, in fact, in some cases, this means that you have a possibility uh, to distinguish some kind of isomers, and this is a case about chirality. Uh, if you have here this, uh, this, this is an amino acid, the carbon, with uh, two bonds behind the, the plane, and uh, this, uh, this, this R group in front of us, and uh, the, the hydrogen on the plane, you can see that these two molecules are the mirror image of each other. And in fact, they are not the same in the same way as the, your left hand is not the same as, as your, your right hand. So this is this uh, stability of covalent bonds that allows uh, uh, the possibility of distinguishing the two species. So as example of chirality, you have amino acids. And I think that Nigel has already uh, explained that uh, before. But you have also uh, the components of nucleic acids, and here adenosine monophosphate, which is in fact a monoribonucleotide, which, which is built from D ribose. And we, you can see that we have four different chiral carbon in this uh, molecule, which means in fact that you have two to the power of four isomers, which is 16. 16 isomers. So it, 
there is a consequence for synthesis, of course. It's difficult to synthesize specifically a, a compound involving a sugar. Anyway, one of the, uh, the conclusions of the preceding information is that organic chemistry is, on, is in some way predisposed to the development of life. First, by the ability of carbon to form kinetically stable architecture, including other elements, life takes advantage of the stability and the diversity of the organic structure, and it is relative to the chemistry of the most abundant elements of the universe, and of course it should be uh, common in the universe, and in fact, but, uh, but in fact, it is not always related uh, with life. And uh, from a historical point of view, uh, this idea that life, uh, uh, that organic matter would not always be related to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to life in the universe should have appeared at the beginning of the 19th century, and in fact it was just after uh, the spatial origin of meteorites had, had been understood and accepted. Uh, and uh, there is, the, I think, the first mention of carbon in a meteorite, which was made, in fact, just after the fall of uh, meteorite in Alès. And uh, the meteorite has conserved the name of Alès with the uh, old spelling of Alès, the new one is this one, uh, and uh, three decades later, Berzelius, which was, uh, who was a Swedish scientist in 1834, published a paper in which he, indic he indicated that this meteorite contained some organic matter. This presence of organic matter was confirmed later with other falls of meteorites, for instance, uh, in Orgueil near Toulouse in 1864. Uh, a consequence of the presence of organic matter in meteorite at this time may was considered more or less that uh, uh, life could be present everywhere in the universe. And uh, this induced the theory of uh, panspermia, that life could mi migrate from one body uh, to an another body of the solar system. But now we, we know that it is not true, in fact, and uh, the analysis of uh, uh, the comet Shuri made by the, uh, Rosetta indicated that, that this comet is made of about uh, op about, yes, 40% of organic matter. And this matter is of a biotic origin. Uh, but the, the, what this confirms the idea that uh, uh, organic matter is widespread in the universe, and uh, this is the case uh, in molecular clouds uh, through processes uh, that have been developed by uh, Nigel Manson. Uh, Mason, sorry, uh, in comets and also in the atmosphere of Titan, the satellite of Saturn, uh, who, which has an atmosphere of methane and nitrogen, and also in meteorite. Okay. So about uh, about uh, interstellar uh, organic matter, molecular clouds, which are formed, in fact, and uh, I, w I want to emphasize on this, that they contain 99.9% of the organic matter in the universe, as was published in 2006. Uh, more than 160 molecules have been observed, and uh, this, uh, this number has increased. Uh, the important point is that these molecular clouds are cold, uh, between 10 and 100 Kelvin, and uh, probably they contain much more molecules than those that have been observed by radio astronomy. I took some examples uh, of uh, molecules that are found in this uh, structure. We have hydrogen cyanide, 
carbonyl sulfide, formaldehyde, hydrogen cyanate, cyanoacetylene, cyanamide. This compound may have very important, a very important role in the development of prebiotic chemistry. There are many more, but I only mentioned this one. But as I said that there are probably many more molecules in, in the interstellar matter, and this can be under, understood by looking to more precise or more accurate analysis that can be, that can be performed on organic matter uh, found in meteorite. And this is a work that has been carried out in Munich by Philipp schmidt Coplin, uh, which is the high resolution mass spectrum analysis of, I think it's organic matter uh, of a meteorite. And you can see, oh, sorry, you can see here the full mass spectrum with a uh, uh, high number of peaks. If we focus between the mass unit uh, three, 315 and 324, we can see that we have ma uh, uh, peaks, several peaks for each mass unit. You can exp we can expand a little bit more here. Uh, with, we, we can see that for one mass, 319, you have almost perhaps uh, three or yes, 30, perhaps 30, uh, 30 peaks. And even if you choose only this part, we can see different peaks. And as you have a high resolution, it's possible to identify molecular formulas. And you have, moreover, to consider that for every molecular formula, you have the possibility of different isomers. The result is that in this mass spectro, uh, in this mass spectro, you have probably tens of uh, thousand molecules, perhaps yes, more than ten thousand molecules. So that the, the conclusion is that the diversity of organic matter of interstellar origin exceeds largely what is found in biology. So if we want to make uh, some biology from the uh, biotic organic chemistry, we need to have a selection process. So uh, another important, info, uh, if we look at prebiotic chemistry, as it is the organic chemistry that is more or less related to the origin of life, this means that what we call prebiotic chemistry is dependent in some way on the hypothesis that we can have on the origin of life. And there are a lot of hypotheses, and uh, I will not speak of uh, the non-scientific one, which are purely beliefs, in fact, but it's not in the scientific field. But even uh, in the scientific field, we have had some beliefs that have had consequences on the development, even on uh, chemistry. And uh, one of them is uh, vitalism, uh, which is a belief that uh, dates back from the antiquity, uh, and that uh, stands that uh, living organisms are states that living organisms are fundamentally different from non-living entities because they contain some non-physical element or are governed by different principles that are inanimate things. And in fact, we conserve in our scientific uh, views of today the fact that organic chemistry, the chemistry of organic matter, is separated from inorganic chemistry. In fact, there is no strong uh, difference between organic chemistry and uh, inorganic chemistry. However, they are taught in university by different uh, teachers, so we conserve this separation. Uh, and another important belief for associated with vitalism was, of course, spontaneous generation. 
this ground, the, the, the vitalism, the ground of our vitalism, have been dis dismissed during the 19th century, and the first time was the experiment of uh, Friedrich Wohler, who synthesized urea, which is considered as a, an organic compound, from ammonium cyanate. Later, you have also the synthesis of amino acid by Stricker in uh, 1850 starting from aldehyde, hydrogen cyanide, and ammonia through an amino nitride. This amino nitride is uh, extracted from the medium and then put in acidic media to obtain a hydrolysis. Also, the foremost reaction from Butlerov in uh, 1861 that leads to the formation of sugar or at least carbohydrates from formaldehyde in the presence of calcium hydroxide or other metal hydroxides. Uh, you had the uh, refutation of uh, uh, spontaneous generation by Pasteur with this kind of uh, apparatus uh, in which uh, an organic solution uh, in water was uh, heated uh, to 100 degrees, and then, uh, as it is tightly closed, uh, there is no formation of living organism, uh, uh, except if we open the flask so that germ can, uh, can enter into the flask, and then living organism develops. Uh, the conclusion of Pasteur was, of course, that living things originate only from living things and about the origin of life, you understand that this is a, a little problem because uh, we have the, uh, the problem of the origin. At the same time, however, we had the development of the theory of evolution by Charles Darwin that uh, starts from the idea that uh, uh, evolution is the result of reproduction with modification and natural selection. One, the, one of the consequences of this theory was that all forms of life uh, on the Earth uh, are coming from a single common ancestor, and also that there is a continuity in evolution. And I think that Darwin himself thought that there has been a continuity between chemistry and biology with respect to evolution. And this comes from this uh, well-known letter to Hooker in 1871, but if and oh what a big if we could conceive in some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric acid salt, light, heat, electricity, etc. present that a protein compound was chemically formed ready to undergo still more complex changing. And we can see that this, uh, this sentence suggests a continuity. In the beginning of the 20th century, we had some uh, new theories on the origin of life and uh, the first one that need to be mentioned is probably the one of, proposed by Leonard Trollant in the United States that the first form of life may have been a chemical entity capable of reproducing itself. So this world, are, this, uh, this entity was constituted by an enzyme or an organic catalyst uh, in 1914, and later he spoke of a genetic enzyme that was identified by himself as a nucleic acid, which is really important, I think, or an autocatalytic enzyme, which means that he had understood the importance of autocatalysis for the origin of life. You had also these uh, uh, theories by Oparin and Aldain that life originated from organic matter from uh, biotically. And Oparin proposed the role for colloidal particles formed by association of organic molecules in, in the ocean, in solution. Uh, and he also proposed that their metabolic activity that should be uh, fermentation, because there was no oxygen, this metabolic activity generated a selection process 
through which the more efficient uh, entities could be conserved. Uh, Aldine, on, the, uh, on his part, uh, suggested that uh, uh, organic substance must have accumulated in the ocean to form some kind of uh, concentrated soup, and he was at the origin of the term prebiotic soup, which is one of the hypocytario for the origin of life. I want to also mention people that are less known and uh, that addressed not only the question of the formation of organic matter, but uh, the question of how life proceeds, in fact. And uh, especially uh, Alfred Lotka, who in uh, just uh, 100 years ago proposed that natural selection should be added to physics as a physical principle. And this allows to understand how, uh, this may allow to understand better how life works. And I just uh, took two sentences. The two fundamental laws of thermodynamics are, of course, insufficient to determine the course of, even in a, of events in a physical system. They tell us that certain things can't happen, but they don't tell us what does happen, which means the fact that the first principle, which is uh, the conservation of the energy, and the second one, that uh, things evolve towards equilibrium, don't help us to, to predict how a system, like a living organism, is able to work. And uh, he added that the principle of natural, natural selection reveals itself as capable of yielding information which the first and second laws of thermodynamics are not competent to furnish. Okay, so uh, yes, this was for Lotka, but also you have Schrödinger. Schrödinger is a well-known physical scientist that who was involved in uh, quantum mechanisms, in the discovery of quantum mechanisms. And in 1944, he tried to answer this question, how can the organization of living organisms be made compatible with the second law of thermodynamics? Which, which is, of course, a, diffi a difficult question, because uh, living organisms tend to increase the degree of organization, which is, in fact, not compatible with the second law that uh, states that all things evolve with the, uh, towards disorder, if you will. So, and his answer that, that it is possible to do so by feeding the system with low entropy energy so that the development of organization can be compensated by the dissipation into it in order that the overall entropy doesn't decrease. So, so this was at the first part of the uh, 20th century and uh, of course in the, in the second part it started by the Miller experiment. Uh, Nigel already spoke of this uh, this morning. Uh, just uh, this is another representation. Uh, the ocean represented by this flask is water. Uh, is heated, then you get some water vapor that goes into in second flux, which he, in which an atmosphere containing reducing gases uh, is submitted to electric discharge. We condensate, etc. Obtain uh, this uh, system was uh, the experiment was carried out for for several days, which gave a product that was analyzed with three different amino acids. Alanine, the one with a methyl group, here R is a methyl group, glycine with an hydrogen, and aspartic acid, which is here, and all the minor compounds, including some minor amino acids. Uh, okay. So, uh, as, uh, as uh, Nigel indicated, uh, there was soon quite uh, criticisms about this experiment. The main one was about it, this, was that this experiment was carried out according to the Urey uh, hypothesis on the uh, composition of the atmosphere of the primitive Earth that could be 
uh, made of reducing gases, hydrogen, methane, ammonia, nitrogen, and uh, similar gases. Uh, this is not compatible with uh, scenarios of planetary formation that seems to lead to more neutral atmosphere composed mainly of nitrogen with uh, content in carbon dioxide and also other uh, amounts, mi minor amounts of reducing gases like hydrogen, methane, carbon monoxide, hydrogen sulfide or sulfur dioxide. However, uh, it is clear, what is clear is that at the period of the origin of life, so uh, uh, if I made uh, uh, an assessment of this time, it was between 3 or 3.3 billion years ago and 4.4 uh, billion years ago, soon after the Earth formed, uh, the atmosphere of the Earth was, uh, there was no oxygen at all in the atmosphere. It's only about 2.5 billion years ago that photosynthesis by cyanobacteria bacteria uh, led to an increase in the, uh, in the content in oxygen that has only reached the present day content above, uh, of about 20%, uh, uh, five or 600 million years ago. So quite recently, when you look to the history of the Earth. So Miller and his group carried out other experiments using more neutral atmosphere composed of oxygen, uh, carbon dioxide, nitrogen. Uh, and in fact, they found initially that there was almost no amino acids that were formed in, from this mixture and they used this apparatus, they put a water solution here, uh, but they soon uh, considered that in this apparatus, in fact, there was also the formation of nitrogen oxides and this nitrogen oxide induced the formation of nitrous and nitric acid in the aqueous solution. So, this nitrous and uh, nitric acid were uh, decreasing the pH and decreasing the possibility of forming amino acid and also uh, they led to the formation of nitrites and these nitrites were able to oxidize the amino acid and then uh, destroy them in this amino acid before they can be utilized. So, they repeated the, the experiment by adding uh, some crystals of calcium uh, carbonate in the, uh, in the flask and also by adding a reducing agent that was able to remove any traces of uh, nitrite in the solution and in this case the yield of amino acid was slightly increased. Uh, was increased, so not slightly, uh, but, uh, but in fact it remained however, lower than in purely reducing atmosphere uh, containing ammonia and methane. Anyway, this means that some, some organic matter has been formed in the atmosphere. Uh, it, it, we, we have to consider that atmo uh, organic matter on, on the Earth uh, came both from the atmosphere and was delivered from space. It may also have been a contribution from the chemistry that takes place in a reducing environment that that uh, that, is, that are found in uh, in uh, in the rocks in uh, and from geological source of energy because we have reducing uh, min minerals like iron or so iron sulfide or things like that uh, that can reduce carbon dioxide and lead to small amounts of organic matter. So we have different sources of organic matter. I also want to, to emphasize that just three weeks before the publication of the experiment of Miller, there was the publication of uh, the structure of DNA by Watson and Crick, the famous uh, double helix, uh, in which we have two anti-parallel uh, strands that are 
uh, bound to each other through uh, hydrogen bonding be between pyrimidids and purines with uh, two hydrogen bonds between thymine and uh, timine and adenine, uh, three hydrogen bonds between cytosine and guanine. So uh, this uh, structure led to understand how genetic information can be stored in cell and uh, we understand the nature of genetic information and soon after this, this uh, structure was um, discovered uh, biochemistry made very huge uh, development leading to understand how this information could be transcripted into RNA, then how it was translated into the sequences of protein through the genetic code. And it seems at the beginning of the 60s that all the molecular features of biochemistry were understood. Uh, so that it led to what is called the central dogma of molecular biology, in fact, that considered that information is related to DNA, DNA can be replicated, the sequences can be replicated, the information can be replicated, it can be transcripted into RNA and then uh, translated into the sequence of proteins and the phenotype is expressed corresponding or genetic uh, or the genotype, the phenotype is expressed generally by proteins through catalysis, enzymatic activity, or uh, molecular recognition. After that, it was discovered that there are examples in which uh, viruses are able to replicate their own RNA and also to reverse transcribe uh, their RNA into DNA. So, this means that there is a possibility of replicating sequences of RNA in present day life so that there was a, an, hypo, an hypothesis and uh, I think uh, uh, most biologists are, are quite confident with this hypothesis that there has been a RNA protein world uh, in which the genetic information was carried out by RNA and the phenotype could be expressed by proteins. And what are the differences between RNA and DNA? So not everybody is a chemist, so I explain a little bit. We have the sugar in ribonucleic acid, RNA is a ribose, in DNA is a deoxyribose, so this hydrogen replaces this hydroxyl group. The bases are almost the same for adenine, guanine and cytosis and there is just a little difference be because uracil uh, in RNA replaces thymine uh, in DNA which see, we can see that we just have a methyl group uh, which is replaced by an hydrogen. So it's understandable that uh, RNA can take uh, the same role as DNA except, except that the presence of a hydroxyl group at this position uh, facilitates uh, the breakdown of RNA and so that the genetic information so stored in RNA is less stable than in DNA. Anyway, uh, there has been later an observation that it is, that RNA is stable uh, is capable sorry to form a folded uh, structure and that these folded structure are able to perform catalysis so it was able to express a geno uh, phenotype so that in fact it is possible to consider and this is the uh, basis of the RNA world hypothesis that RNA could play at the same time the role of storage of genetic information and of the phenotype uh, able to perform catalysis. This hypothesis has been quite fruitful uh, because uh, it took advantage of all, all, the, all the tools that have been discovered in uh, molecular biology. Uh, everything in my 
in the molecular biology of nucleic acid of RNA is able to help the studies of the RNA world hypothesis. And uh, this hypothesis was that life could have started from RNA, RNA star, strand having a, polymer, a polymerase activity capable of polymerizing itself, in fact. Uh, so this corresponds exactly to the definition of uh, Trolland, or Leonard Trolland, uh, in the beginning of the century of a genetic enzyme in, uh, in, in 1917. So this uh, RNA world hypothesis was also able to uh, show that evolution that can take place at a molecular scale and uh, this was made by Spiegelman in uh, 67. Uh, we started from RNA sequences uh, and uh, uh, reproduced them by uh, the action of an enzyme that was introduced by in the experiment. And he showed that it's possible to uh, evolve the sequence of RNA uh, in order that their replication is, uh, occurs as fast as possible. Of course, he obtained a shorter chain, but it was the first uh, example of, uh, of a possibility of evolution of, at a molecular scale. However, all this chemistry of the RNA world supposes that there is a possibility of uh, presence of concentrated nucleotide or nucleo, uh, nucleic acid segments so that it's possible to, to make ligation between segments uh, so that in fact it, consti it constituted uh, a kind of, as, uh, as, uh, as told by Joss and Orgel, it's a, it's a dream of molecular bi biologists but from uh, prebiotic chemistry it's a nightmare. It's not possible to get this uh, kind of, of solution. However, some progress has been made in chemistry, in the prebiotic chemistry of nucleotides. The first one was by Oro in 1961, who synthesized adenine, uh, adenine by polymerizing hydrogen cyanide. However, it's quite difficult to, to imagine uh, obtaining a nucleotide, a ribonucleotide from the components, from the building block like ribose adenine and phosphate to get this ATP, which is a monomer, uh, one of the monomer, uh, AMP, sorry, which is uh, adenosine monophosphate, which is one of the monomer of nucleic acid. And uh, in fact, uh, the question is trying to form a nucleotide just by adding one of the three uh, building blocks, is it the good solution? And in fact, if we Take the case of cytosine reacting with ribose. This reaction does te doesn't take place. The second thing is that uh, the second drawback is that ribose itself is instable in the in the in, in the under the condition that could help in uh, making uh, the bond. So John Sutherland suggested that there is no reason that the prebiotic and uh, and biochemical pathway could be identical. And he started to experiment uh, alternative pathway of synthesis. And uh, this is a pathway that is made from completely different building block. He started from cyanamide that he reacted with the sugar with two carbon, glycoaldehyde, to form this amino oxazole. Uh, then it, he added uh, here its glyceraldehyde, a sugar with three carbon, to get this bicycle. So the green is not really <laughs> readable. Yeah. So he obtained this compound. Then cyanoacetylene to obtain this uh, compound having three cycles. And the addition of phosphate, phosphorylation in fact, uh, led to the formation of this nucleotide uh, or activated uh, nucleotide. Uh, this was in 2006. He improved 
the group improved the, uh, this reaction by showing that phosphate was able to catalyze this reaction through the, forma the intermediate formation of this adduct uh, that increases the, the, the efficiency of the reaction. And another observation what the, was that it was possible to isomerize the site in uh, derivative here into the uracil derivative so that uh, it yielded in fact to two of the four bases needed for uh, making RNA. So we have different uh, scenario for the origin of life. One is the soup hypothesis that I spoke about before. Uh, many components in the, in, the, in the ocean and then uh, emerged some form of life at a certain uh, stage. The genetic scenario corresponding to the uh, RNA world hypothesis, but there is also a possibility based on metabolism. Uh, there have been development about this, uh, this hypothesis in the 80s after it was uh, clear that uh, it was difficult to synthesize organic matter in the atmosphere of an early earth made of CO2, uh, nitrogen and CO2. So the alternative was to consider the possibility of formation of organic matter by reduction of uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, uh, using uh, reducing mi minerals and also Gunther Wachterhauser who was, who was uh, 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 supporter of this hypothesis considered that evolution may have started from autocatalytic cycles that may have improved uh, in order to, to, to lead to life. And one of the, of the ideas is that uh, biochemistry may have conserved some of the pathway, some of this pathway from the early beginning and there is still activity in this field and just I mentioned this work made by uh, Kamilia Mushkovska and uh, Joseph Moran in Strasbourg that have shown, for example, that uh, if you start from pyruvate and glyoxylate, it's possible to get nine of the 11 intermediates of the uh, citric acid cycle, the Krebs cycle, uh, that may lead to uh, organic matter by working in the reverse direction. However, we have issues with prebiotic chemistry. The first one I mentioned before, the issue of diversity. And this diversity, of course, includes chirality. But chirality is only one of the uh, problems with diversity. We have to make a selection. Selection one chiral form of amino acid, but 20 amino acids amongst uh, a uh, very big number of amino acids that are possible in prebiotic chemistry. We have also a problem with template reproduction, which is a process by which nucleic acids are uh, replicated, because when you elongate uh, one strand of nucleic acid on a template, uh, as, as the, as the, the strand uh, elongates, is, is longer, it forms a stronger bond with, with the template. So it's difficult to dissociate, which in fact impedes to some extent uh, the exponential growth of nucleic acid sequences, or RNA for example. The metabolic approach of course uh, suffers from some lack of evolvability. And we have also uh, an issue about the improbability of the spontaneous association of a cell from its components. And in fact, this is the, the goal of uh, synthetic biology, making an artificial cell, uh, cell from uh, chemical components. The, the idea is that uh, you can have a, a recipe for, for a cell, uh, that, uh, that you introduce uh, in the good order and then you, you get, but this doesn't work. The only very important success of synthetic biology were the experiences that have been made by Craig Venter, 
uh, that have shown that if you start from a living cell, if you remove all the nuclear component, all the genetic component of this cell, and if you inject in this cell a synthetic genome, the cell is, is capable of working. So it's possible to change the, the genetic component of the cell, but you need for this a cell that is already working. We don't know what remains in this cell without nucleic acid that making make it able to work after a new genome is inserted into the cell. So something is lacking, is missing, and uh, I want to emphasize the, the, the contribution of, uh, of uh, Schrodinger, in fact, that introduced the idea that you must feed the system with low entropy energy in order that it is dissipated. You need energy dissipation. Energy dissipation is capable of uh, making very fascinating phenomena in cell in biology. You have, for example, uh, the assembly of microtubules from two uh, from dimers of uh, tubulins. They are only made of uh, dimers of tubulins, these microtubules, and uh, they are highly dynamic in the cell. They form, they cleave, uh, and it's uh, it's a permanent dynamic, and this dynamic is related to the activation of the dimer by, uh, by uh, an energy carrier, which is not ATP, adenosine triphosphate in this case, but a related compound, which is uh, GTP, uh, guanodine triphosphate, uh, so that when, you, uh, when uh, the dimer is activated, it has a possibility to polymerize, and as soon as you uh, is, uh, as it is polymerized, it can uh, GTP can be hydrolyzed into guanosine diphosphate and phosphate, and then uh, when you have no uh, at the end of this end of the microtubule, when you have no uh, GTP, then the uh, the whole tube microtubule uh, breaks down very rapidly. So and this is used, for example, uh, in cell division to, to carry the chromosome from uh, one another. Okay, we have, also, we have examples, and this example uh, has been introduced in uh, 2010 uh, by uh, the group of Jan van Esch in the Netherlands that, are for, that start from a quite simple uh, amino acid-based substrate which in fact in which we have a carboxylate group uh, and this is shown here on this model uh, carboxylate group which is highly soluble in aqueous solution and they activate the system by something which is absolutely no, need not biologic it's uh, it's an, uh, an alkylating agent which is in fact toxic for living organics dimethyl sulfate or methyl iodide so that the carboxyl group is transformed, transformed into an ester, which is more hydrophobic, or at least uh, less hydrophilic. The result is that you form some aggregates. And these ag aggregates form some kind of fibers. You can see the fibers here. And the result is that at some time, the, the, the liquid solution that you have uh, at the beginning becomes, becomes a gel. And uh, then, after a certain uh, time, uh, the, the ester is hydrolyzed in the al alkaline media, and then you recover the solution. It's in some way exactly the same as microtubules. And this is what has been called dissipative self-assembly. I will not develop too much, but just uh, tell you that they have been investigations on, of how these systems can uh, work. So you start from a monomer, which is activated. This activated monomer can polymerize. Then the, in the polymer, the monomers can be uh, deactivated and then you uh, dissociate. And depending on the different kinetic constant in this system, you may have very different behaviors. Uh, 
and even uh, the possibility of the of a cycle working only in one direction in some way you have some imbalance and having solution far away from uh, equilibrated system in fact and this leads me to 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 come back to Alfred Lotka and this shows that if we want to make life you have to take into consideration kinetics which are very important kinetics uh, leads of course to selection and uh, one of the supporters of the importance of uh, kinetics is uh, my colleague Adi Pros uh, from uh, uh, Israel in fact who introduced uh, this concept of dynamic kinetic stability, which means, in fact, that uh, living things are, in fact, stable. If you look at, uh, at, uh, at life on Earth, life is present on the Earth at least from uh, since uh, 3.5 uh, 3 billion years ago. And uh, this means that life has a stability. Very few things are present on the Earth uh, for 3.5 3 billion years ago. And these stabilities fr come from the fact it's not, it's not stability at equilibrium like in thermodynamic. It comes from the dynamic ca character of life uh, and, and also can be associated with uh, processes of replication and autocatalysis, which leads, of course, to selection, natural selection in life uh, and the improvement of the system that, that evolves and becomes more stable. So, uh, as uh, there is the idea of dissipative uh, self-assembly of system, we could introduce this term of dissipative self-replication. I was surprised to see uh, that this, this term has been only uh, introduced last year, in fact. I uh, I'd found no mention of this term before, but uh, when I read uh, this term for the first time, I think, oh, yes, it's a, it's a very good idea, because you can consider, this is an autocatalytic loop. You start from a catalyst, you add a, react, a reactant energy uh, that it dissipated into it, you get this intermediate, and this intermediate will be able, in a, in a perfect autocatalytic cycle, to give two multi molecules of catalyst. So you increase the concentration of uh, a catalyst, you, in some way the system is made more orga uh, organized so that you have to compensate for this uh, creation of order by creating disorder, it's why it needs it need to be coupled to the dissipation of heat. This is completely, in principle, completely independent of the nature of this catalyst. It may be uh, chemical, but uh, it may also be a machine. You can imagine uh, this kind of machine, which is, who could be able to, <coughs> to perform uh, the building of another, uh, another self, uh, another himself, itself, in fact, using uh, raw materials and energy. But you have to couple this process to the dissipation of heat. And this is the same for, for a cell, a bacteria that grows at the expense of food and produces another bacteria. Everybody here knows that uh, uh, living organisms are associated with uh, the dissipation of heat. So, the question, one of the questions in the origin of life is the discovery of truly autocatalytic processes. And there are a few examples. One, the best known, is uh, the Formos reaction, however. But there are not so many examples, and this is a problem. Uh, so, the Formos reaction, as I said before, uh, leads to the formation of carbohydrate, sugars from formaldehyde. Why is there an autocatalytic process here? The first reason, and I think it's more important, is that the direct reaction of Formos to give a dimer of Formos, here you have a carbon-carbon bond, 
uh, sugar with two carbon, this direct formation is not possible. The system has to find an alternative possibility. And the, there is here an, alter, an alternative possibility that is starting from the sugar with two carbon, adding one formaldehyde, which is possible through a reaction that is called an aldol reaction, uh, leading to glyceraldehyde, which is a sugar with three carbon that can be isomerized into another sugar with three carbon, which is dihydroxyacetone. This dihydroxyacetone, again by aldolization, can add a new formaldehyde and so on, up to uh, sugar with five carbons. And the important point here is that you can isomerize all this sugar and it, at some point, you can have aldolization in the reverse direction, which is a retro aldolization, which leads to the cleavage of the sugar uh, the, with four carbon into two sugars uh, for, with this bond, uh, leading to two different molecules of uh, glyceraldehyde. So you start the cycle with one gly glyceraldehyde, you make one round and you get two glyceraldehyde. This is autocatalysis. But as you see, what's important is that there is no catalysis at all in the system. Autocatalysis comes from the architecture of the network. And you have the same from sugar with five carbon that can be cleaved into one sugar with three carbon and one, one another one with two carbons. So the Catalysis is a consequence of the architecture of the network. And this means that if you are a chemist that is used to study reaction only by starting for reactant, leading to the product and trying to optimize uh, the reaction uh, one by one, you will miss this kind of autocatalytic process. And in my view, this is the reason why there are so few autocatalytic processes that have been discovered in prebiotic chemistry, but they may be other ones. And I come back here. here. I so told you that one of the important conditions for autocatalysis was that the direct reaction doesn't take place. And this is related to uh, an observation that has been made by Albert Richard Moser uh, who considered that the expression of nonlinear or, or autocatalytic processes, the development of self-organization, is facilitated when straightforward spontaneous processes are low because the environment is protected from, uh, uh, for, uh, is held far from equilibrium by kinetic barriers. Uh, and I, I told you that covalent bonds are associated with strong genetic marrier, which, which suggests, in fact, that uh, complex kinetics, complex behavior may be facilitated with the chemistry of carbon, so that, in fact, the reactivity or the non-reactivity of a molecule may be important in the development, or the, in the development of uh, self-organization. So, and the idea that is that if spontaneous straightforward reaction takes place only slowly, there is room for complex processes. And this is just the idea that is behind. It is simple, this is obvious, but uh, I think it's really important. So another point is that autocatalysis can reproduce a Darwinian behavior. They can reproduce exponential growth. Uh, of course, provided that the system remains in a far from equilibrium state, they can also reproduce selection, and this has been made a long time ago uh, by, uh, I think, Shane Olifson, for example, uh, who uh, shown that if you take two autocatalytic loops that compete for a single reactant, if you provide the system in a limited amount by adding the compound with a constant rate, then you can get the kinetic equation of the system. And this system 
uh, uh, can find only a steady state if one of uh, if the concentration of one of the autocatalysts, C1 or C2, is equal to zero, which means, in fact, that the more efficient autocatalyst uh, is able to drive the other one into extinction exactly at the, the, uh, the same as um, uh, uh, species can compete in the same ecosystem uh, for a single resource. So, this is for more personal development, in fact. If you consider this autocatalytic loop, which is in a, works in a dissipation, dissipative way, uh, we can uh, consider that energy has to be provided here, which is this arrow on this energy diagram. Uh, if we want this reaction to work irreversibly, it means that the intermediate I here must not uh, reverse the reactants, uh, which means that the kinetic bar here here must be uh, must be high, and high enough so that in fact the uh, the reaction the reverse reaction doesn't take place when one round of the cycle is uh, is, uh, is 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 observed. So in fact, here you need energy to compensate for this kinetic barrier and you need energy to make some chemistry so that the energy that you have to provide is the sum of these two uh, uh, energies. If we focus on the reverse step here, uh, you have a, a, a relationship between the, the free energy level of the transition phase and of the intermediate which is, of course, an equilibrium related to an equilibrium constant. This equilibrium constant itself is the ratio of the two constants, rate constant, the rate constant for the reaction, reverse reaction starting for intermediate and leading to transition state, and the rate constant for the breakdown of the transition state. These rate constants are uh, the inverse of the time needed for the uh, reaction to proceed so that you can see that the rate constant is also a, a ratio of the lifetime from the transition state and the time needed for the reverse reaction to occur. And you uh, remember that I spoke about the fact that the time needed for the reverse reaction was it was important that it is longer than the time, the reproduction time, the time needed for, uh, for uh, having the, the cycle uh, completed. Uh, and uh, of course, the lifetime of the transition state is something that is known from transition state theory. It's related to a vibration of the transition state and close to 0.1 picosecond, 10 to the minus 13 seconds, in fact. So that using these values, we can, considering a lifetime of one day, uh, a generation time of one day, a temperature of 25 uh, Celsius, and then we have an order of magnitude of the free energy, which is about 100 kilojoule per mole. If we add here, and I will not develop why, uh, a value for making chemistry of about 50 kilojoule per mole, then you get 150 kilojoule per mole, and this translates for energy in terms of electromagnetic ra radiation with uh, 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 electromagnetic radiation with a wavelength of below 800 nanometers, which correspond more or less to the uh, domain of visible and UV light. And this suggests that there is an important uh, role for uh, uh, photochemistry at the origin of life. And I show you this example. Uh, don't look at the complexity of this system. The important, this was carried out in, uh, this work was carried out in the lab of John Sutherland and corresponds in fact to the photochemical uh, reaction of uh, uh, this sulfide. Uh, that leads by irradiation uh, with uh, UV light to an electron which is able to reduce 
hydrogen cyanide and other nitrile to give this compound. And in fact, applying this system to a to solution starting from, uh, uh, from hydrogen cyanide very led to the possibility of synthesizing mm -hmm. a lot of compounds, amino acids, threonine, uh, glycine, uh, nu nucleic acid components here, uh, nucleotides, even uh, this uh, phosphoglycerol, uh, which is in fact a component of the phospholipid of the membrane. So there are many possibilities with this kind of chemistry. Another uh, very recent work, was, we, we was, which was carried out in the same lab, uh, uh, was to use uh, uh, this time sulfite, uh, that uh, the photochemistry of sulfite that can reduce, in this case, even carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide can be reduced to give several carboxylic acids, uh, including uh, this one maybe citric acid, so uh, you have acetic acid, you have uh, many, many formic acid, many uh, compounds, uh, compound, uh, composed of carbon. Okay, so I left some questions, uh, especially the question of polymerization, but I, have to I had to make the selection. Uh, uh, I just mentioned uh, the importance of systems, not directly, but uh, uh, systems are important, but I think that Kepa will speak about systems chemistry on uh, Friday. But uh, I think uh, maybe it's enough for today, and just uh, I go to the conclusion. Uh, that life is associated with organic matter of the, as a result of the limited reactivity of covalent bonds rather than to a specificity of organi organic structure. This means that, in my opinion, reactivity matters perhaps more than structure. The, uh, the driving force for the emergence of evolution of life is of kinetic nature, is, and this is uh, uh, the, this means that life is related to processes uh, as much as uh, to the structure of biochemicals. And uh, if you want a simple model reproducing natural selection, you can make it just uh, using a non-reversible autocatalytic cycle that is fed in energy, that dissipates energy. And uh, the last conclusion uh, of very recent work is that there is a relationship between the energy that needs to be provided to the system and the ratio of the lifetime of transition state to that of the generation time for the reproducing entity. So uh, that's all. I thank you for your attention and uh, I'm ready to answer some questions. <laughs>